Ladies and gentlemen, I want us to welcome the Minister of State in charge of tertiary education, Professor Kwesiyaka. Please put your hands together for him. Thank you very much. Thank you. Honorable Minister for Education, Dr. Mante Koku Prepet, Deputy Minister for Education, MCT, MCT Executive Secretary. Executive Secretary for NAB, the National Accreditation Board, members of respective university and tertiary education councils here, represented, representatives of um, the several agencies, the Ministry of Education here, Vice Chancellor's Ghana, amply represented, and other representatives and officials in government and in the private sector. Stakeholders, let me add my voice to the words of welcome I already extended to you by the moderator, and also to say that this forum is a very important one that has been long anticipated. Um, it adds to the several fora that have been organized by the ministry in connection with this particular document that is going to be adopted. The document operation started as far back as last year. Uh, the committee chaired by Professor Tego were charged to come out with a policy document that was all embracing and that took into consideration the pre existing legislation policies already in place and update these policies in the light of recent events. After the document was submitted to the ministry. The ministry did yet another stakeholder workshop. Remember, the document itself was written having consulted several stakeholders, including the vice chancellors of Ghana, administrators, and heads of public institutions and private institutions. Then the document was subjected to a workshop forum by the same stakeholders. It was after the workshop forum that the write-up was again revisited and then submitted to the minister who in turn submitted this to cabinet for consideration. And this is yet another forum, post-document, post-approval forum, sort of. And uh, to talk about this and to set the ball rolling with the minister for education Self, whom I invite to take over from me, uh, do part of the presentation to be followed up by a continuation of that presentation by the Executive Secretary of the NCT, the National Council for Tertiary Education. Ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Matthew Pogo Prempe, Thank you. Good morning, invited guests. We would like to share with distinguished guests the trust of government policy on tertiary education. The Ministry of Education ultimately responsible for ensuring that education is provided at all levels and that that education is relevant and it responds to national goals and aspirations. Expanding access to quality education at all levels is one of our mandates to see to that. That means we have to initiate and formulate policy for approval by cabinet and his excellency the president. Initiate legislation in furtherance of those policies approved. Coordinate those policies and programs associated with the various legislation and approval. Provide a responsible budget to see to the implementation of those policies and programs. 
and at the same time try as much as possible to monitor and evaluate and ensure that policies have the relevant impact. As far back as 20th February 2017, just after we finished the transition, issues emanating from the transition and sectors that were brought forth what government should do in tertiary education to make it more relevant for the 21st century. And I can see call sometime in February 2017. This was discussed with the vice chancellors who were present. Some of the issues that had arisen from the transitional time and that was brought forth in those discussions actually included regularization or ensuring the speedy upgrade of Tamale and Cape Coast Polytechnics to technical universities amongst the four that were remaining. The creating of a common application platform for undergraduate, and I emphasize for undergraduate enrollment into public universities. The universities are still the deciders of who gets admitted and who doesn't. We were challenged by the fact that to go and do medicine in a public university now, the poor guardian has to buy five different forms. And it was felt that it was very, very unnecessary. And even in an advanced country that had more money, technology was employed and they had a general admission or applications platform where even private universities were part. Secondly, in Ghana, there are other tertiary education groups that already enjoy a common application platform where still those institutions retain uh, control over the admissions. The third issue that agitated the minds was setting up of a national research fund where I can say that it's within Parliament now, the law is in Parliament. The Common Admission Platform, the Vice Chancellor speaks, the Kessy Call, on the Cessalacy, the President, sometimes this year. And one of the issues they brought up was the fact that they virtually agree that it will take up from next academic year. We talked about adoption of renewable energy and energy efficiency measures in public universities because the issue of cutting electricity supplies, huge bills, there was a need to look at it. We talked about compliance with the Fees and Charges Act of the country and that all IGF generated in a public university, in a public fund, or public fund, and is governed by the IGF law. And amongst them, the IGF law states those institutions and the amount of the IG or percentage of IGF those institutions can retain for activities that are also approved by the Ministry of Finance. So if you are allowed to retain 100% of your IGF. That is half of the issue. What that retention can be used for is also decided between the agencies and the Ministry of Finance because it's public funds. And they are subject to audits and accountability through the Auditor General and the Ministry. Actually, we talked about outsourcing of non-core activities by the university, including calls of residence. Taking cognizance of the fact that most universities have adopted the policy of in, out, out, out. Preferred meaning probably 75% of the student population 
live outside the confines of the purview of the university. We felt that probably, probably we need to look at the core activities and non-core activities that the university management should concentrate on. Just one of the last items, or the last item we discussed, is working towards one act for the universities. The foundation of this, uh, in this country called Ghana, in 2012, under His Excellency the President John Ivan Atabils, all the 38 colleges of education were brought under one act. Under His Excellency John Ramani Mahama, in 2016, all the technical polytechnics and the technical universities were brought under one act. It does not obviate that university's mandate, but 98% or 95% of any university's law is the same as others. It's only probably the first five to six clauses that limit or outline the functions and the mandate of the council and the university that is different from each other. These, alongside other issues, were subsequently raised in a letter that I sent to the regulator, National Council for Tertiary Education, to expedite work on these issues. That was generally what we felt that we would do in tertiary education. Ours was not to take up with the management of tertiary education, not at all. We also recognize that in this country, Ghana, there is no document called the tertiary education policy. There's not a single source document that you take an open and see the trust of government on tertiary education policy. That itself must be revised uh, periodically. Better government or better countries have it, and there was a need to start something. This culminated in May 2018 when the Minister of State, after assumption of office, I gave him a copy of that letter and told him that by By and large, that is the thing, this is the policy direction we have for tertiary education. You should receive it as much in order to run with it. Because then we have a Minister of State that has risen to the Pro Vice Chancellor of a public university and has become the Vice Chancellor of a private university. So if there's anybody who could um, work with the professors, and the dorms and the universities, it's probably him. In May 2018, the Minister of State, in consultation with the National Council for Tertiary Education, commissioned an expert team with the following terms of reference to produce a reference document pulling together the various isolated policies he used and institutional best practices that will position institutions to better, better discharge their funding. Take cognizance of the national vision, the 1992 constitution, and existing legislative arrangements, proposed additional policies and guidelines considered essential to deal with emerging trends in the governance and effective running of tertiary institutions. Take cognizance of current policy, current policy and reform initiatives of government. The draft policy, as has been just said by the Minister of State, Professor Yanka, has gone through the mill, culminating in the validation workshop 10th January to 12th January, three day workshop in Koforidia, chaired by Prosayanka. 
the stakeholders included all the entities that were mentioned. Hulk, Precoff, Grasak, Moves, UTAC, VCG, NAPTEX, NAP, NCT, CTAC, and all the, all the acronyms. This revised policy has been approved by Cabinet on May 9th, 2019. And Cabinet charged us to refine it and launch it. Before the refinement and the launching, there's a need to sensitize the major stakeholders and players in the tertiary education space to, to generally have a, a feel of where we're going. Interestingly, the expert committee was chaired by a former vice chancellor of the University of Ghana, Mr. Tate. It included the executive secretary of NCT. It included the executive secretary. The, the executive secretary of NCT, I understand, is a professor of mechanical engineering. Who's that? Clifford Tego is my senior. He examined me in medicine. He's in medicine. Kisri Yako, who is also a UG staff in the economics department, who uh, are by the psychology, was also a member of the committee. Mr. John Darcy, Deputy Executive Secretary of NCT. Legal practitioner Professor Ayite, Mr. Paul Ifa, a committee full of people from the university communities, both private and public. And one of the reasons why we are here, the post policy, where the Policy where there are existing legislation demands a revision of those legislation. Because the policy, before you can implement, needs to be translated into legislation. So there's a need for this policy to be translated into legislation. That is why at the validation workshop in Kofuria. A draft policy, a draft bill was not hidden. A draft bill was not hidden, was not dictated. A draft bill was given to all the stakeholders. Actually, a presentation of a draft was given to all the stakeholders to take, take it to their communities and give us suggestions on how to improve the draft bill. Actually, the first time it's been done in this country. So it was rather very unfortunate that government being so open from experts committee, validation, draft bill, we hear on radio, if it was just criticism, that was part of the suggestion we needed. But I'll try to insult. Policy approved, one of my marching orders is to do a sensitization and awareness workshop. Interesting, interesting. Most stakeholders have brought suggestions on how to improve the bill. There's absolutely no need for persons to take particular interest in insults. Right? We never expected, government never expected that from a tertiary education space. That an engagement, so frontal an engagement, can degenerate. We have to keep quiet because we still have to get policy through and deal with the issues. Ours is supposed to respond to everybody who comes up the airwaves. There are about 300 stations in Ghana. I think the ministry says they are going to every radio station uh, to report. Uh, we can never do our work. Ours is to concentrate concentrate on our work and charge the path. We just want to demonstrate that this 
It's not something that has been just picked out of the pocket and thrown. We've looked at international best practices. And I have with me, bank, okay, have, me I have with me examples of 10 countries, very, very democratic, extremely democratic, some even more democratic than ours. 10 countries. That, when I did the research, I came. There are very many, actually, there are many more countries. But the ten I, that was interesting that I came across that have one university. I've already said in Ghana we have one act for 46 colleges of education, which are all tertiary. We have one act for 10 technical universities, which are all tertiary. But I looked at Norway and they had one act for all their universities. I looked at South Africa and they had one act for all their universities. I looked at Denmark and they had one act for all their universities. I looked at Kenya, and they had one act. I actually recently met the chief director who's the Kenyan act. I wanted him to come and speak at this forum. They have one act. And that act in Kenya includes even both public and private universities. I checked Malaysia, and they had one act. I went to Singapore, and they had one act. I went to Finland, and they had one act. I went to Zimbabwe, and they had one act. I went to Sweden, and there are 10 countries that almost every month you see on the WhatsApp platform, Ghana education, go and learn from Finland. Ghana education, go and learn from Singapore. Now we go and learn, and we are tempted, and we are insulted. We have ample opportunity to contribute to legislation to make it better, but not to stop legislation because it's impossible. I remember when the University of Ghana was passing this last legislation, I was in parliament as an opposition MP. And I held that legislation down for some time. Interesting. I held that legislation down for some time because I felt there was a clause in that legislation that would be used Interesting, we had a debate on the floor. That would be used to prevent private citizens or public from entering legal. I have a hunch. One clause. I argued and held and held. And one of my colleagues from the government side he said, I assure you that this will never happen. So I let go. A few months after the passage of the University of Ghana legislation, it happened. And I heard national security. Instead of George Joyne on two occasions came to break down Ligon erecting the gate. But that antecedent had been set in the law. So I'm pleading to the committee here. It is not right. It is an invitation to make the law better. As to countries that we want legislation means government is going to be taking this. The President has assured all the Vice Chancellor that he was the Attorney General that took criminal libel off the books. And he is not going to be the President that wants to come to the University and take anything. Management, governance and accountability has got nothing, actually nothing, to do with academic freedom. All over the world, there are countries that have shown that have one university act that are freer than even ours. So if we are learning from them, we will learn the best practice from them, include what makes Ghana different, and we hope to get better legislation. We hear always international best practices. What is that? Is our intellectuals going outside, learning from what is happening elsewhere, and coming back? make sure that ours is better. That is exactly what we want to do. We have no interest. The government has no interest. And like I said, if anybody can point to a place that shows that this clause means that you are dictating, we will revise it. There's absolutely no need to fight. We are demonstrating good faith. 
But when it comes to issues like government says, some universities have 10 board members, some have 20. So we want a standardized thing for policy harmonization. I think. We have said nothing wrong because even in the country Ghana, we already have such legislation. That is not meant to say that we are going to emasculate the universities or shut the universities. It's not possible. Those that contributed to this where we are today are all from the university. They are all from the highest rank of management of the universities. And I'm not sure, I'm not really, really sure if they put something down, they want to be the former vice chancellor of the of Ghana who wants to ask to do something that will cripple the hand of the University of Ghana. But we live in reality. And the democratic government and democratic accountability must be enshrined. That is the trust of government policy. Nothing to do with detention, nothing to do with interference, and got nothing, absolutely nothing, but to tell the universities how to behave. On that note, I would like to sorry for the to take us through and sensitize and make us aware about the tertiary education policy, the legislative and institutional reform implications of the policy, and possibly, if we can do that in 30 minutes, we will, we will, we will highlight certain things about the draft bill. But the draft university bill has received extensive stakeholder re response that we are, we are computing and compiling and making sure that it reflects sufficiently where good in the bill. But I'll give an example. All my university lecturers have met, all my professors have met, all the acts that have met, council, external council, or the supervisory council of the university, has more external members. Actually, interestingly, I got a response from the University of Ghana that said in writing that they want more internal members than external members or something to that effect. But I looked at their law, the University of Ghana's law that exists, that we passed in 2010. And interestingly, they have more external members than internal members. But they wrote to me that they were more external than external. But their law that exists was different. They had more external than external. So that is not to say we have, we have come to the university and dictated to the university what they are doing. And our life is absolutely to share with us the trust of government policy approved by government of May 9th for tertiary education. Thank you. So we will look at some uh, salient points arising out of the tertiary education policy document. And then secondly, uh, we would want to take this opportunity to provide a certain rationale for the draft public universities bill. The uh, minister has uh, uh, you know, talked to some of the points that have come across uh, on this particular bill. Actually, at this stage of consideration of the bill, uh, it ought not to have been in the public domain at this stage. And uh, what we are looking for is inputs into the zero draft, if you like. The zero draft is what was circulated. We sought stakeholder input so that we can produce a document that we can call a working draft, working draft. And it is the working draft that then will take through the process of consideration and approval. So we don't even have that working draft as we sit here today. The objective was to get the input on the zero draft uh, so that we can see how we incorporate the comments. And then based on the refined version, we have what we call the working draft uh, to carry that forward. Unfortunately, uh, the matter ended up in the media domain, and uh, you know a lot has happened. A lot of water has passed under the bridge. And I think one of the key points that have been raised most often 
was that uh, it wasn't even understood exactly why we were doing that. So I will try and provide a certain uh, rationale for doing the bill itself. I think Minister has done that, but there are some provisions that people found a little problematic. Uh, we would pick one or two of those positions and try and explain what informed that. Um, the National Education Policy Document itself um, is a very bulky document. It's almost about a uh, what 80 page document. So I cannot, uh, at a forum like this, you know, go from cover to cover to let you understand what is in there. Uh, I can only pick, as I said, highlights from that. And uh, the highlights will just uh, indicate in each one of the thematic areas that the policy has been approved. Uh, what the, I think I needed a Okay, so, uh, so I'll do only the highlights of uh, the aspects of the policy uh, so that we can understand what is in uh, The minister has indicated what the, uh, the context in which this will be done. Uh, we have the antecedents, antecedents to the uh, policy, and it goes back to uh, February 2017 uh, when some of the initial ideas that goes into the policy uh, were discussed. And I, I, would, I would call the 10 or 11 point agenda, this uh, agenda of uh, agenda, uh, the, the minister's own manifesto for reform. Uh, this is what was communicated as he indicated to you. And uh, that provided the basis for the discourse leading up to the uh, adoption of the national education policy. So this agenda was communicated to the NCTE with uh, a directive to initiate action on how uh, these reforms will be carried out. And as we engage in the exercise, uh, it became quite evident that in order to do it properly, what was required was a much more exhaustive and comprehensive approach to developing policy. Uh, so we could situate these 10 or so uh, points in the context of a comprehensive tertiary education policy. So it led to the formation of the committee by the Honorable Minister of State. The committee took about three or four months to work on it, and that went through stakeholder consultation. Uh, after that, we had a revision of the policy. Uh, we submitted it to cabinet, and cabinet gave us approval, subject to further refinement. So here we are to share the details with you. As far as the policy itself is concerned, we have been told uh, by the Honorable Minister what the rationale has been. Uh, in our very recent uh, experience, in the last decade or two, you'll notice that there has been quite a rapid explosion in the institutions that are providing uh, tertiary education. Uh, the growth has been quite sporadic and haphazard and part of the reason is that if you look at the policy environment in which this has happened, it's largely been driven by isolated policy and, uh, if you like, piecemeal interventions. Most of what has happened has not been guided by setting overall bigger picture about what the evolving education system is supposed to look like. And it hasn't been difficult for us to come to the conclusion that in order to guide this process properly towards the vision of 
providing an education system that presents our country as a learning society and a knowledge-driven economy, we needed a much more comprehensive, coherent and well-articulated holistic policy framework. And this policy framework allows us to provide clear guidelines for what the ultimate structure of our tertiary education system must look like, and then it gives us the different dimensions of what needs to be done for that ultimate structure to be approved. And that involves the planning aspects, development, regulation, operations, and overall governance and accountability of the system as a whole. All of this in one document where you see the different pieces, but you also see what the interconnections are uh, to give it that holistic character. So the document itself, as I said, is a very big one, almost about uh, 80 pages. Uh, in terms of structure, uh, it is presented in five broad areas. And these areas include governance and management, uh, under governance and management, we have institutional level governance. Uh, we also have external governance, which is where the institute and uh, the uh, ministry interfaces with the uh, institution. Uh, we have aspects dealing with appointments and designations of uh, principal officers, academic freedom. That's our third subject. I'm sure it will come up uh, subsequently in the discussions here. And then there's an aspect on accountability of tertiary education institutions. There's another main chapter on equity and access. And this has to draw from constitutional imperatives. Our constitution actually devotes a lot of um, attention to the need for access and equity. Uh, aspects of that relate to expansion and establishment of tertiary education institutions the provision of flexible and distributed learning, diversification and differentiation. Ultimately, that's the policy that will determine the structure of our tertiary education system. And then, the third chapter is on quality and relevance. Very, very important aspects, and you will find that uh, the sub-themes under this is very long, all the way from uh, entry requirements into our tertiary institutions through academic progression, postgraduate training to uh, the physical structures that must be in place uh, to guarantee uh, provision of the tertiary education to the standard that is required. Then we have finance and then uh, cross-cutting issues. Uh, these are issues on inclusivity, uh, gender, sexual harassment, we also have HIV, ICT. So that's the structure of the policy and the, the sub teams that are captured under that. As I said, I'll just pick a few of the items in it so that you can appreciate what is there. So our policies uh, on governance and management, uh, the first sub item is on coordination of the tertiary education system. There has to be an overall in charge that looks at the entire landscape like the uh, conductor of an orchestra uh, to ensure that everybody is in place, they are playing to the right tune, they are standing at the right place, and then contributing to the harmonious tune that the uh, orchestra is supposed to generate. Coordination and oversight is very important. The policy statement, uh, number one, the Ministry of Education shall have general policy formulation and monitoring functions over the system. That is at the overall level. And the regulator, there shall be an apex regulatory body whose responsibility shall include general supervision and direction for all tertiary education institutions. That is at the external uh, governance uh, level. In terms of institutional level governance, it's important to state that the structure of governance within the institution recognizes what is called the bicameral system. 
and the recognition arises from the understanding that as far as the broad strategic issues are concerned, you will need a council that will take the strategic policy related decisions, but eternally there are structures that are so provided to ensure that every segment of the investor community contributes effectively to eventually the strategic decisions that are made at council. Uh, so in order to ensure effectiveness of this institution level, uh, institutional level governance, there are policy statements that uh, have been uh, listed. The Ministry of Education shall ensure that the acts of governing public universities are harmonized to ensure consistency and enhance operational effectiveness and efficiency. If these are public institutions of the same generic type, providing a certain service with similar expectations, you want to make sure that their structure and operations are consistent, and they provide a certain level of predictability, and makes it easy for the governance and the control mechanisms to work. The second one is government working through the regulator uh, to set out desirable qualifications for members of council. And because we tend to have a stakeholder council, these desirable qualifications need to be shared with these constituent uh, uh, bodies so that in nominating their representatives, they will be guided by that. Membership of the councils and boards of public tertiary institutions shall not be less than nine number, but not more than 30. And the rationale, you will see that this is quite a significant departure from what our recent legis legislation has provided. The rationale here is to have a compact board that is agile in decision making and that leverages the advantages of this bicameral system I was talking about. Essentially, you are seeking to have a much more lay board where you have more external members of the council focusing on the strategic decision making. Even though the numbers of the core board members is being limited to between 9 and 13, the councils themselves will be uh, mandated, and there's a, a policy statement to that effect that the council shall have the power to co opt additional members from outside the institution by such co-opted members uh, once so down with non-voting uh, in status. Which means that if you have a certain issue that you need to discuss and you need expertise from outside the council, uh, you can do that and expand the membership accordingly. And then the provision also is that you should have at least two thirds of the members of council being external members. So we don't have, uh, we don't want more than a third to be coming from within, and that is staff <coughs> and students. This is what the essence of the labor board is. Appointments and designations, appointments and designations of principal officers. Uh, we've had quite some diversity in how this is handled. Some of it errors in the legislation, some also institutional practices that have influenced that. So the concept has become a little confused when it should be quite upright. Uh, principal officers are officers who by designation and in their capacity can commit the university. And the policy says, this designation of principal officers shall apply only to the chancellor, the pro-chancellor or the council chairman and the vice chancellor, period. That is the list of principal officers. Everybody else will come by their names and designations, but there will be some other uh, officers, not principal officers. The vice chancellor and other officers in the institution, and I underline in the institution because this is something that is used in the clause that we are referring to shall be appointed by the governing council in accordance with Article 1953 of the 1992 Constitution. The Chancellor shall be appointed by the President following a recommendation made by the council 
and only chartered universities shall have chancellors. We have university colleges and all shapes and sizes of uh, tertiary institutions that purport uh, to uh, have chancellors and uh, that is actually contrary to what uh, the practice must be. Policies on academic culture, uh, use of academic titles, this is another area that has been abused. And uh, my colleague at NAB has had several occasions, and uh, I believe the Minister of State to speak about it. We are making policy statements to reflect that. Tertiary institutions shall enact statutes on the award and conditions of use of for academic titles, including honorary degrees. Appointment of emeritus or emerita professor must be based on merit, must be based on statutes, and granted only by the university from which the person retired as a full professor. And once again, only chartered institutions or universities may award honorary degrees or appoint emeritus professors. Academic fraud. It's a global phenomenon we know, but it's getting uh, quite prevalent in our country here. And the danger is that you get people presenting themselves for what they are not worth. And they end up uh, in employment and all kinds of uh, places. It undermines the credibility of the system and trust you know, in the system as a whole. Policy statement, all forms of academic fraud are criminal and must be handled by the appropriate agencies. No university or tertiary education institution must purport to be dealing with issues related to academic fraud. It is fraud and it's criminal and the authorities, the appropriate agencies must deal with it when uh, you come across that. Employers also have the primary responsibility to confirm credentials presented to them from people who are seeking employment. Accountability of tertiary education system. Naturally, public tertiary education institutions are set up by law to provide quality education in specific mandated areas and are guided by delivery standards. These have to be provided exactly as mandated. So the regulatory body shall have adequate mechanisms in place to demand accountability from tertiary education institutions which institutions shall abide by these uh, mechanisms. Tertiary education institutions shall be subject to quality assurance and accreditation at both institutional and program levels. The regulatory body shall establish a mechanism for ranking of institutions by type and programs. We need to be able to know in time uh, how we stand in relation to others who are providing uh, similar services. And that is good for the institution because it's motivation, but it's also good for the prospective student who is seeking uh, to do a program in the university. And whether we like it or not, in this uh, global uh, village that we live in, you will be ranked whether you like it or not. You don't have to subscribe to be ranked. <laughs> you will be ranked whether you like it or not. So the area we prepared ourselves dealt with the issues that are required for ranking the better for us. And then the regulatory body shall publish the recognition status of tertiary education institutions as prescribed by law. Policies on equity and access. Uh, this is partly a constitutional injunction. So while the establishment of new institutions, uh, the sub-item is on expansion and establishment, uh, while the establishment of new institutions have been by government in response to the constitutional imperatives and expansion, uh, the constitutional government has actually taken charge. Government leads the process of expansion of existing institutions, uh, but the, the creation, the expansion of existing institutions have largely been driven eternally by the institutions uh, themselves. Normally, with little or no reference to the ministry or the regulatory agency, and there are consequences arising out of that. 
Uh, the implications are that it affects the broad structure of the system. It may distort the diversification and differentiation that we talk about. It drives cost, and a lot of the time it leads to what we call mission creep. The institution is set up to do A, and by those gradual modifications and expansion, different programs, sooner or later you can't identify it for uh, the purpose that it was set up for. This has to be checked. So government acting through the regulator shall ensure that the expansion of existing and creation of new institutions shall be guided by the policy on differentiation and diversification. Uh, by the way, the idea of differentiation and diversification uh, is to actually reflect on the structure of the tertiary education system in a way that it responds to the diverse needs of the labor market out there. So we need to set up the system in such a way that all the different options that the labor market would require, there are institutions to provide that. And within every generic category of institutions, like universities, uh, you has, must be sufficiently differentiated from uh, UCC, uh, so that even within that generic category, we provide still further options. And that is what will guide the structure of our system. All public tertiary institutions shall develop 10-year strategic plans, which shall be endorsed by the regulator and provide a framework and plans for future growth. If this happens, then this is a plan that is locked with the regulator and on a day-to-day -day basis when you take decisions, the decisions can be referenced to that so that all of us can assure ourselves that you are gradually and incrementally building capacity and deepening your uh, uh, control of the mandated aid. Uh, public tertiary institutions shall operate within their mandated focus area prescribed in their enabling acts. Expansion of existing institutions through the establishment of branch campuses shall be based on a careful assessment of capacities to effectively manage without compromising quality, and this has to be agreed with the regulator. The government shall promote technology-driven options to ensure equitable access to quality education, including the active promotion of open and distance learning. Participation, uh, private participation in tertiary education. Now, while the role of the private sector is considered key, uh, there have been complaints about proliferation and poor quality uh, standards in some of our institutions. Uh, in the future, as the demand grows, naturally we are going to need more private sector provision, but there has to be policies to regulate that. So government shall provide an enabling environment to attract and sustain private sector provision of tertiary education through the policies and incentives. Private tertiary education institutions, including cross-border services, shall be established in accordance with appropriate legal and regulatory requirements. And the regulatory body shall institutionalize monitoring and evaluation to make sure that everybody stays on admissions, and this is still on access and equity, our 1992 constitution enjoins the state to provide equal access to university or equivalent level education with emphasis on science and technology. And uh, you are aware that the NCT publishes minimum entry requirements, usually based on WASI results uh, for candidates that are seeking to enter our tertiary system. Currently, these admissions are decentralized, but they are not always driven by some of the constitutional imperatives in terms of access, equity, inclusion, and all that. So the policy statements seek to address this. All students seeking admission to tertiary education institutions must meet minimum entry requirements. Under no circumstance should somebody be admitted to tertiary education institutions when they haven't met the entry requirements approved by the regulator. Qualified candidates shall, as much as possible, be placed on merit, except under special circumstances when addressing equity and inclusion concerns. And this is the big one. There shall be 
the centralized applications and placement service for public universities. Private tertiary institutions shall be encouraged to enlist on this service. And as Minister underscored here, it is an applications platform, that's all that it is. But it's sanitizing the diversity of approaches that we have used uh, in the past until now, and uh, it also makes the application process much, much easier for prospective applicants. Uh, it provides a repository for you know, data, very important data on attributes of applicants, matriculation, numbers, preferences of programs that we can immediately access live to inform uh, a policy going forward. So it's a very important platform, and uh, as it did indicate, uh, the next academic year, obviously, the uh, admissions are virtually underway, but uh, they have been work on this, and I'll touch on that briefly as we go. Lastly, admissions of different categories of students shall be guided by quotas. We have had uh, fee paying students, uh, we've had foreign students, we've had all minor of, you know, categories of students are being admitted. We need to look at it relating to the constitutional imperatives and set quotas. Fortunately, if we have a platform that we are like uh, the one we are designing, these quotas can be embedded into the decisions that the universities make. The universities still will be in charge of the decision making on admissions. Nobody is going to take that away from them. Policies on quality and relevance. The development of new programs must have relevant industry stakeholder input and support. That's the first policy statement. All new formal degree programs proposed to be delivered at a public tertiary institution must be subject to relevance, clearance, and accreditation by the regulator. No programs shall be started unless they have been duly approved and accredited. And tertiary education institutions, in developing their programs, must be mindful of their mandated areas and they must emphasize that. Your program portfolio and your enrollment must reflect your mandate. That is what distinguishes you from other institutions. Academic progression and graduation. Uh, students enrolling in tertiary education obviously expect to make progress during their different stages of study and to complete on time with prior agreed competencies and outcomes. These are the expectations that our students have, and the policy environment must be such that we guarantee that. Tertiary education institutions shall have appropriate information management systems to capture progression and attrition rates for each course, program, and institution as a whole, and report same annually to the regulator. Number two, the regulator shall design and implement a tertiary education management information system for easy and reliable retrieval and analysis of data to inform policy. And thirdly, tertiary education institutions shall conduct trace to know how they are faring in industry and how their performance is fair that we haven't done well, uh, you know, as far as our university system is concerned. Uh, but incidentally, that is what distinguishes a university from a real university. Research and innovation, the training of postgraduates, this is what distinguishes a university from a real university. It is through these activities that new knowledge is generated and high level manpower produced. Unfortunately, we lag behind. All the countries that you see there, we lag behind them. South Africa, Kenya, Nigeria, Uganda, in areas of research and publication and postgraduate training. We need to do something about that. The policy requires that governments will be committed to increasing funding for research from the present 0.3% of GDP to at least the AU minimum benchmark of 1%. Government shall establish a national research and innovation fund to address priority areas of research and development in support of national uh, economic growth and poverty reduction. 
Thirdly, government shall facilitate the setting up of centers of excellence in selected universities and disciplines, particularly in science, technology, engineering, mathematics. And the regulator shall identify and designate research intensive universities for special support. We can, it cannot be that all of us will be active and relevant as far as research uh, and the postgraduate training is concerned. We will need to identify institutions that have the biggest potential to support them so they can make the best impact. This is targeted support. Now, teacher education. Academic attainment of students, as we all know, depends very largely on the extent of uh, what, the competence of the teacher. Uh, the teacher, on the other hand, also needs to be prepared so that they can be more competent and inspiring uh, in the classroom. The policy statements. The ministry shall ensure that colleges of education and other tertiary teacher education institutions provide relevant, high-quality teaching and learning. Number two, the ministry shall ensure that the curriculum reforms in teacher education are coherent and they address the national teaching standard and the education curriculum, the teacher education curriculum framework. Uh, and this is a big one. Tertiary education institutions shall ensure that all academic staff go through teacher education programs to prepare them to teach. It is not enough to have a PhD in zoology. You need to have the competence to impart the knowledge that you have gained in zoology to the students that you are teaching. And you can only do that when you have been trained in the uh, techniques and know-how to teach. So new appointees shall have graduate certificates in teaching. Before you are employed as a lecturer, you need to go through a formal training program to be so uh, acknowledged as somebody who is capable of teaching. Uh, of course, the implication of the policy is that those who are already in the system, and I know most of the investors are doing that anyway, uh, you organize summer programs, all kinds of continuing professional development programs to equip them with the skills to teach. This is an opportunity for UCC and the UEW. Uh, can you imagine rolling out a postgraduate certificate uh, in how to teach in universities for all the university uh, lecturers uh, who don't have this background. Then the last but, uh, bit is uh, colleges of education shall be integrated into selected universities as university colleges. I want to talk about tertiary level TVET. This is also a very important, and I believe my friends from the technical universities are here. It's a very, very important part of the reform agenda. Uh, we know that currently the TVET instruction takes place largely in our two politics, uh, polytechnics and eight uh, converted uh, technical universities. Uh, the potential for this impacting on our economy is huge. And we rely, we want to rely a lot on what these institutions deliver. Policy statement. Technical universities shall be the apex institutions in TVET for the training of highly skilled human resources to drive economic growth. Number two, technical universities shall operate and be regulated as specialized universities with niche mandates. And I want to repeat that. They shall operate and be regulated as specialized universities with niche mandates. And the fact that you are in the TVET domain does not make you a vocational institution. You are first and foremost a university, and then secondly, a university that is primed to deliver a certain type of education. We want to emphasize that. Uh, technical universities, while achieving parity of esteem with the universities, shall not depart from the practice-oriented philosophy of Tibet. I know there are a lot of tensions, you know, because we are in some kind of transition towards the eventual setup that we want to do here. Uh, and all kinds of, uh, uh, what, uh, tensions are leading to distract. We will keep the focus and make sure that ultimately, when we agree that your conversion is finally completed, 
you will be set up in a way as to deliver within the TV domain. We don't intend to create you as replicas of the traditional universities. We need to acknowledge that. Uh, technical universities shall create progression pathways at tertiary level for practically inclined SHS and technical school graduates. And you shall develop strong links with industry. And this is a new one, part of the reform. There shall be a university that is specialized in the training of teachers for all levels of Tibet. In fact, uh, I don't know if the Honorable Minister uh, would allow me to say that. Already there's a proposal to bring together about eight or ten or so of the colleges of education that are in areas that are in Tibet. Uh, to bring them up together with uh, Chairman, I'm sorry to say that, that's UEW Council Chairman. We are going to take away the Kumasi campus of UEW, the Mampong campus of UEW, and then together with the colleges of education set up the nucleus for this specialized university that uh, uh, the policy advocates. Policies on financing. Um, this ED, I'm sure, will be looking forward to this, like everybody else. Uh, a sustainable funding policy framework shall be put in place to include the cost sharing, uh, Students Loans Trust, Ghana Education Trust Fund, and Ghana Government Scholarship Scheme for Priority Discipline. This is the, uh, what, the complex of uh, measures, interventions that will provide a framework for financing. So this is the first point. The second point is that cost of tertiary education shall be shared between government, tertiary education institutions, students, and the private sector. This is a long-standing stakeholder agreement on how we should finance tertiary education going forward, and it's being captured in the policy. Government budgetary allocation to tertiary education shall be at least 2.5% of GDP. It's a policy aspiration. At least 50% of the GET Fund budget allocation shall be dispersed to tertiary education. Tuition shall be free for all Ghanaian students except those who opt for fee paying categories. Ghanaian students shall pay academic facility user fees. And for those in halls of residence, you will pay residential facility user fees and of course the cost of utilities that you consume. These are user costs that you will need to uh, take care of. non ghanaian students naturally shall pay the full cost of their education. And all tertiary education institutions shall be required to generate at least 30% of their budget required from internal sources. So this is actually the, if you like, um, the best idea of what is entailed in the tertiary education policy. Uh, if there are other dimensions you think are missing, uh, we can take that up in the question and answer. So naturally, the policy will transform into a number of reform initiatives. And I just decided to list them uh, for your information. So the draft bill of the Public Universities uh, uh, Act is, is on. The Centralized Applications and Placement Service. Uh, Ghana Tertiary Education Commission. Uh, there is um, a merger of uh, NEP and NCTE uh, to provide more effective regulation for the sector. And that will be called the Tertiary Education Commission. Uh, National Research and Innovation Fund Minister alluded to that. Uh, tertiary education management information systems will be set up for effective coordination and uh, supervision. UDS is a policy uh, 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 what? Uh, statement, it's a policy intervention. Government is actually uh, splitting up UDS into three independent universities. So the one campus becomes the University of Business and Integrated Development Studies. And then the Nabrobu campus will become University of Technology and Applied Science. Uh, University of Media, Arts and Communication. Uh, this will be the university coming out of uh, Ghana Institute of Languages, uh, NAFTI, and then Ghana Institute of uh, Journalism. 
uh, colleges of education being converted into university colleges, we have already communicated that to the universities uh, concerned. All the colleges have been assigned to the universities. There's an affiliation uh, arrangement, a collaboration framework that we have provided for them to confer and help us uh, guide the process. There will be a certain transition between now and the next two to three years where the colleges will effectively become part of the universities. Then the specialized university I talked about that will focus on training teachers for the TVS sector is the National University of Skills and Entrepreneurial Development. Uh, we would also uh, be taking steps. Actually, we have already gone quite far in doing that in establishing an open university in China, where we can leverage technology to significantly increase the uh, supply of uh, tertiary education. Outsourcing, of course, of residents as part of the policy on the university divesting itself from non-core activities. The policy is for uh, the university to consider outsourcing calls of residence so they can be managed by people who can manage them better and uh, provide the services that uh, they are supposed to provide. And then I mentioned the postgraduate certificate in teaching for university lecture. I think UEW and uh, UCC owe me a consultancy fee. Uh, this is a very important thing. So that's the reform. Now, uh, the just highlight of what uh, issues have come around in relation to the Job Public uh, Universities Bill. Uh, as you would know, apart from the eight technical universities converted from polytechnics, under the Technical Universities Act, as amended by Act 947, there are 10 traditional public universities in Ghana. Uh, these 10 are currently mandated by different acts. PNUST, uh, under PNDC Law 240, amended Act 559 of 1998. Uh, UCC, UDS have PNDC uh, what, rules. As we sit here today, if you wanted to constitute their council, you will need to find somebody to nominate a representative of the committees for the defense of the revolution. Because it, it, it is uh, the under PNDC law, uh, 278 and 279. UPSA uh, 2012 at 850, GIMPA, UMAT, and uh, UEW uh, from 2004, University of Ghana 2010. You have a UENR, uh, probably the most recent, so UESD actually is the latest. I have missed that one now. Uh, UMAT and UENR 2011. Now, the reason we are seeking to do what we are doing is that many of these answers you will see are long overdue for review. The context in which the laws were passed, as I said, you know, when the revolution was taking place, has changed. We have since moved on. Uh, with our constitution into uh, a republic, and some of those things predate the public republic, and so they are working. There are key provisions in the various laws that vary widely, but sometimes they even appear to contradict from one university to the other, and these need to be reconciled. There are new policies and reforms in tertiary education that have to find expression in the enabling laws of these institutions. And that has to be accommodated. There's a need also to ensure a more effective regulatory oversight and accountability. And that means that provisions in the law, particularly in relation to uh, appointment of chancellor and council, term of office of council, functions of council, uh, that likely impact on mission of the university or carry contingent financial uh, liability. All these things need to be addressed. So apart from the act being dated, there are very substantial material things that need to change. Uh, council membership structure to reflect the lay board that we talked about and emphasize the bicameral system. Need to harmonize provisions to ensure consistency and predictability in governance across the public uh, universities. And then it gives us the opportunity also to insert clauses. Uh, we have had in our recent history a number of challenges in how 
universities and government uh, through their council. And some of these experiences need to reflect uh, in the uh, changes going forward. Obviously, it's one of two options. Either you pick the individual acts one by one and go through the laborious process of consideration from all the stages to parliament and have them approved, or you do what we are doing. In fact, there are two variants of doing the individual acts. The first one is carry out limited amendments of the individual acts and bring them in line with bring them in line with the new policies and reforms. one is to carry out limited amendments of the individual acts and bring them in line with some new policies and reforms, but preserve the so-called autonomous structure and functions of council. That's one option. The second option would be to amend the individual act. It's a variant of looking at the individual acts and bring them in line with the new policies and reforms and to provide for more effective regulatory oversight and the second option would have been more comprehensive in trying to deal with the issues that the combined bill would deal with. Okay, the first one would be retaining certain provisions in the individual acts which people feel emotionally attached. Either way, if you know the process by which a bill eventually gets passed into law, you will appreciate that this will be a counterproductive effort. It will uh, be an extremely laborious effort time wasting and at the end of the day you may not be able to achieve the objectives that you set out to. But it it would have given some comfort for those who are uh, saying that one act is making the investors look the same. I believe the minister's examples have actually demonstrated that. By no means, the one act for all universities, by many jurisdictions you have what is called a higher education act. It's not just the universities, it is the regulatory bodies within the sector who are also captured under that one act. And it doesn't make them the same. Each individual university has its own mandate and they operate as such. Uh, we have Polytechnics Act. Uh, it didn't make Tamale Poly the same as a crowd poly. Uh, we have Technical Universities Act. Each technical university has a mandated area. In fact, in Uganda and uh, Kenya and all that, they have this. Uh, similar act, but you hear more about Makerere than some other universities. By no means does this thing make you look the same, but at least it would have addressed that point. And uh, there's also the perception that it's a one size fits all. And so if we were dealing with them individually, then uh, perceptively, at least you'll be dealing with them uh, separately. These options were considered, and going forward, based on the best practices and the effort that would have been required to get this thing done, it wasn't going to be a viable option. So it leaves us with the option of promoting a common public universities act that will incorporate the provisions reflecting new policies and reforms and the requirements for more effective regulatory oversight and accountability. Why do we do the implications arising from this? Is that uh, this option makes it possible for us to repeal and replace other specific sections of all the entire act to bring them in line with the expectations. It gives us the opportunity to focus on the broad overarching issues, opportunity to harmonize administrative procedures and infuse predictability. The approach is also straightforward. Uh, it reinforces the shared status and attributes of universities as public. Once you are put on that one law, uh, Obviously, your mandated areas will be specified, will be locked into the law, and so you will not look like the other person. But at least you know that you have a shared parenting. All of you are public universities, and that recognition will be more than fair. And uh, as I said, the same approach has been used for. Okay, so this is, this is the option I've done. So I'll just briefly go through some of those areas that uh, we've had some uh, 
let me emphasize again that uh, Honorable Minister uh, reiterate what he said. We have had feedback from a significant you know, uh, number of institutions. And the idea is to sit down and look at all those uh, comments related to the zero drug, see how we can incorporate that. So this is very much work in progress. Uh, what I'm going to provide here is not necessarily justification, but to give you a sense of what the rationale, the thinking behind some of the provisions that we put in there. So, uh, the first point was on the appointment of uh, the Chancellor. Uh, we've had concerns that if you appoint the Chancellor, then you are controlling everybody. Uh, but I keep wondering, I mean, when you form a business, uh, you take control of the board and you decide how the board decisions are, are done, isn't it? If you are a public institution, government has naturally has to have the, uh, the determinacy in what, what you do. This shouldn't be a problem. Appointment of Chancellor, the existing situation is that, uh, especially the post PNDC laws, I've listed them, they empower the council to appoint the Chancellor. The PNDC laws actually empower the president himself uh, to do that. The exception is University of Ghana. The University of Ghana actually has an electoral college uh, in their law, consisting of council and academic board that elect uh, the chancellor. Uh, we have proposed, the proposed amendment is to provide for appointment of chancellor by the president of the republic in consultation with the council. So the councils will do the due diligence and present uh, what, recommendation to the president for appointment. The reason for this is clarity in accountability to the appointing authority, and it resolves the anomaly and contradiction of counsel appointing a person who then takes precedence over it. If you look at the current enactment, the council is the one that appoints the chancellor, and once the chancellor is appointed, then he takes precedence over the council going forward. It looks like in a situation where you have the mandate to appoint your boss. And so when there's a problem, in terms of resolving the conflict becomes a problem. It reinforces government uh, role as a business owner. And from all the institutions, the countries that have the same historical antecedents that we have in Africa and elsewhere, this is what the practice has uh, been. Appointment of the governing council. Uh, most provisions provide for the president to do that in accordance with Article 70. So we would uh, keep that. The proposal is to confirm that provision. Uh, and further to this, additional provision uh, for the minister or the president to exercise his appointing authority, uh, you know, in exercise of the appointing authority to intervene, to put in place interim arrangements if necessary, in situations of crisis and emergency where the position of counsel, the counsel becomes untenable. And this is not a strange plot. Actually, if you look at the Higher Education Act, South Africa, and by the way, we know that when the university rankings are released, the top 20 African higher education institutions, more than two thirds of them come from South Africa. So it couldn't be that this arrangement would impact negatively on how uh, your work is done. The, it has extensive clauses on intervention of the minister. And these interventions include coming in when there's a crisis situation. In fact, the minister is mandated, actually, to enact standard statutes for the universities. And if you like, as a public tertiary institution in South Africa, you can pick what the minister has enacted as statutes and work with it, or you are liberty to uh, add whatever you need to add to it, but that has to come back to Parliament for approval. This is a similar process that we went through with the technical university. It's being done as best practice also. Composition and number of members of the governing council. In most of these acts we have 17, up to 17, the more recent act, out of which nine members are from within the university community. The University of Ghana has an extra provision for appointment of six others from outside the university. I think the total number is about 21 or something. It's similar to what happens in Makarene or uh, uh, Ibadan. The proposal is to limit this number because the experience in that is in 
a cost center, you know, problematic cost center. Uh, the limitation makes a, a council much more compact and agile in decision making, and it reinforces this point about the labor that we talked about. And in line with corporate best practice, the majority of council members must come from outside. Term of office of the council. Okay, so this varies between the legislation and in the different acts that we have, between two and three years for members. Uh, and the vice chancellor is an official member. Uh, three years appears common in the more recent acts. And if you look at the global best practice, this is about the minimum. And there are universities that have the two-year limit, and I just wonder how the council gets to do this business. Because when you are appointed, it takes you time to get to know the nature of the business. By the time you get a handle on it, that's the time you have to renew your mandate. And that's the situation we face with you, Matt, and some other institutions going forward. So the idea is to harmonize this uh, provision and stipulate the three years at least. Two years, obviously, is impractical and the councils barely have enough time uh, to do that. Uh, it would also be consistent with recent uh, legislation. Uh, provisions for accountability. There are various elements that cut across the entire bit. And these are meant to actually look at the context in which decision making takes place and what the implications are. So in all the existing acts, you have unfettered powers to the council to take decisions as necessary for the university's well-being and meeting these objectives. There is no problem, it's not in contention, but there are certain decisions that have wide implications outside the boundaries of the university. Uh, some of the decisions that are currently being made relate to enactment of statutes, internal organization, creation of new colleges, schools, and all that. Uh, Incidentally, when the council has to take decisions that are academic in nature, the council is, it make, uh, the laws make it mandatory, the council is obliged to consult academic board. There's no way council can take a decision on academic related matters without passing it through the academic board. In fact, uh, based on my experience in KNUSD, there have been at least two seminar moments where council took decisions and they had to come back to academic board for that to be looked at. Strangely, decisions can have contingent financial liability that would eventually get back to government do not require the council to even make any consultation whatsoever. So the decision is taken, it has some, uh, uh, it runs into some uh, bad weather, uh, there are huge millions and millions of dollars that the university has to pay. The university quickly recognizes that it has a business owner and it runs to the business owner to build them. What we are saying is that there has to be some engagement. Sooner or later, the university is doing other things other than what it was set up. So these are accountability clauses that we put in there to ensure that there's some consultation. Nobody wants to take decision making away from the council. But decision making has to be done in a manner that is uh, appropriate. Alignment with uh, new policy arrangements. Uh, so there are new things that have come up, like the Ghana Tertiary Education Commission and this, uh, what it does relative to the council. There has to be commensurate provisions in the regulatory bill and in the uh, act of the uh, enabling act of the institution to ensure that that relationship works out well. And then we we'll talk about the cars. Naturally, it has to find a place, and that's how it comes. To Thank you very much. Yeah. Including doing a technical audit, a staffing audit, to see those that qualify to be upgraded and those that don't. That staff audit, technical audit, has been done. That process is ongoing. And even though you say that government should do it, that process is ongoing. We haven't can stop it. But the number of petitions that have come. For those who don't qualify that we should consider, uh, we should sometimes be our brother's keeper. That's all I'll say to that. All right, uh, from here they were to um, the issue of CAPS. You know, the current system that we are operating, it's not just a system that, that frustrates it, it's costly. The amount of stress involved alone in visiting as many universities as you can, 
accessing admission forms, applications. Currently, the average cost involved in applying to one university is 200 cities. And on the average, an applicant would select about three, four universities, a total of 600 to 800 cities. Four or five years ago, there was a gentleman in my village who could not afford buying application forms for one university, which was just 100 cities. As a result, and that is just at that level. We are not talking about the fees that they have to pay when they are admitted. For that reason alone, that boy had to sit at home for a whole year until I discovered him and uh, found some subsidy for him to enter the university. He's graduating this year. He finished his exams uh, this June and is graduating, most likely going to head for a first class. It's a clear example of this. So for some of us who know what real poverty is, we know the value in providing a mechanism whereby at the cost of 250 cities only, that's a recommendation for the capsule. It's 250 cities. It's 250 cities. Yes. That you have access to three or four university choices of your choice. Whereas you would have paid that about 600 or 800 cities. But apart from all this, look at the process whereby universities simultaneously admit thousands of students. And tech admits, Legon admits, Kipos admits the same number of students and the same students. It takes a long time, invariably after reopening, maybe third or fourth week of faculty in the reopening, until you realize that X, Y, Z, whom I admitted, hasn't reported, and therefore may have gone to tech or Kipos and Lebanon and so on and so forth. By that time, he would have blocked the opportunity for another student to enter the university. Now, this process, there's absolutely no way there's going to be simultaneous admission. The system automatically throws out a name so long as he has been admitted, he has accepted the admission. So, here we aim at widening access. We are widening the access apart from the cost but the very machinery of simultaneous admissions would be no more. But finally, let me say that it was a very sticky issue for uh, vice chancellors accepting the caps, uh, mainly because of the uh, sacrifice of uh, revenue. And uh, but I think that was the most challenging aspect of the whole thing for them. When we took them through various countries for them to engage for the system there, they realized that in Nigeria, the initiative of introducing the equivalent of CAPS, what is JAM, that came from the vice chancellor themselves. They, yes, in spite of uh, what appeared to be a loss of revenue. But having said all this, let me say that there is a formula for sharing the fees that is paid uh, by the applicant. It is not uh, a, a zero hundred situation. Um, 100 going to the machinery for uh, caps and then zero going to the universities. There is a formula. A fraction of the amount goes to the universities that were selected and a fraction also goes to the university that eventually admits the applicant. So it's not, it's not a, uh, a, a lose, completely loss of revenue to them. Okay. And I believe this is something that they have accepted now because we engage them constantly. But putting all that aside, there's the ethical aspect of it, where a university admits or receives application for uh, from 45,000 applicants, admits 10,000. So for all the others, about 35,000 or so that, that applied, uh, they are completely at a loss, and I think there's the ethics of it that I'm sure some of them are more in the open. They are adopted to the business team in this country. All right, then. Thank you. Thank you very much, Prof. Uh, that we don't get the wrong pedagogy affecting different institutions. And um, there is a body that I've been encouraging the university teacher associations 
uh, which law is also in Parliament, to be part of is the National Teaching Council, the regulator for teachers. It's not only going to be a regulator for teachers only in the pre-tertiary space, but for teachers all over Ghana, whether in university or whatever, because they look to define the teaching profession in a better way. And one of the issues is that they have not been part, but I've been encouraging the two tag and three tag and things to be part of it. Um, the current chair, board chair, is a professor in one of our universities. They want to enhance the law. Having a postgraduate certificate in education is not only to do with, with, with teachers in the tertiary space. Generally, if that, we, what we have had done in this country is that we have accepted teachers who only go to the teaching universities. And I sometimes think that we have to open up a profession for those who have done pure content to be able to add certificates in education and also go and teach. Because some of those who are teaching lack content. It's one of the biggest issues that um, Canadian education is that far about content. That is why the diploma is being phased out to enforce the curricular changes for two degrees because we want to enhance the content. So for example, somebody who's the dumb math in Lagos who is unemployed but wants to teach might not get a teaching appointment through any official or public place because they want somebody who has teaching. Somebody who has got to do mass education uh, is lacking in content, not all, but maybe lacking in content. They want to do. So what we want to do, we want to create another channel that whilst even in doing mass education in Lagos or Tech, uh, tech has, you can just take on <coughs> A certificate in education as a sandwich course and in between that sort of the uh, kid groups is doing something like that so that you can do it and when you finish you qualify to teach you write the exam as a professional teacher and you are qualified to teach so to the decrease the store of teachers that we have as really competent teachers when we're doing A level I remember most of those who were teaching us in uh, vacation classes and things were from tech, those of us who were far away from Martin. And they were doing biochemistry and chemistry and raw physics and coming to teach us. And I don't think we did bad for where we are now. So we have to encourage the thought that content also uh, uh, matters. So yes, we'll be happy. We spoke with, uh, with Lancaster University and they, they are happy. Yeah. So perhaps I'll start on a lighter note. Minister, you know when you were alluding to the University of Science and Technology, and you mentioned P, you were wondering the correlation between science and technology. Your deputy gifted was telling you that they are doing the science and technology part of P. <laughs> <laughs> so maybe that explains it. But uh, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, I think as has been mentioned uh, already, there have been a lot of ongoing engagements uh, with stakeholders. Um, about these tertiary education reforms and the emerging issues in the subsector, if I can put it that way, the ones that have necessitated these reforms. Cabinet, as you are aware, has given approval to a set of reforms and the intention is to legislate a good chunk of them. Our task here today has been to engage you further on all of these conversations that have been going on behind the scenes. And for us at the Ministry of Information, we are only pleased to provide a platform for this uh, special forum to take place. Uh, as the process continues, your views will still be welcome, and there will still be further engagement. When things go before the, uh, the House, the Subcommittee on Education, etc., people will have the opportunity to send memos, um, etc. And as the Minister said, the idea is to engage, but once we are getting on something, to have it fully implemented. I want to just say a few thanks first to all chairpersons of councils of public universities who are invited and will join us here, all vice chancellors of public universities who are here, all chairpersons of um, councils and vice chancellors of technical universities who are here as well, chairpersons of councils and principals of colleges of education all the presidents of the private universities who are here, 
the unions, UTAG, CTAG, TUTAG, that are all here. We want to say thank you to you. The student bodies that are here as well, we say thanks. Um, we want to say thank you to the National Council for Tertiary Education, uh, the entire team here, especially Professor Salifo uh, and you. So we want to say thank you to you. Representative from NAPTEX and the National Accreditation Board, we are grateful. Directors at the Ministry of Education, those of you who the minister forces to spend hours beyond your labor hours, I've been speaking to him about it, but we want to say thank you that you are all here. Um, Gifty, Deputy Minister, we are grateful. Professor.